All right, so thank you very much for the invitation. It's, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to join you and uh, start this uh, uh, very nice event. Uh, consensus is a fantastic problem uh, to say, like before we start, I think it's, uh, it's a joy and privilege to, uh, to be able to work in this area. It's one of these beautiful problems in computer science. Um, I think it's one of these problems that uh, distinguishes, uh, you know, our, our, our whole field. Um, and it has like this, uh, this beautiful nature um, of these questions that sometimes you find in, um, you know, other fields of uh, more that are more mathematical in nature. It's a very sort of simple formulation, but it's very nuanced uh, and, uh, and, and a very difficult to solve problem in its various different guises and, and forms. Um, so uh, what I want to talk to today is uh, about some work that I've been doing with uh, a number of colleagues and students uh, that uh, has like the broader title Fast Privacy Enhanced Regulation of Fairly Distributed Payments. Um, and I'll um, just uh, go right ahead. Um, the topic is about payments. Is one This application is one of the main drivers uh, behind a lot of the developments uh, in studying problems around consensus. Uh, so I think it's fitting to start a little bit with that problem and see um, sort of bare bones, like what is uh, sort of usually the problem that we have to deal with uh, when we talk about payments and what are the approaches to solve it? So in the bare bones, there's two, um, we have like two parties, let's say Alice and Bob, Alice wants to send some money to Bob. And typically we have two different approaches uh, that we address these problems, like the coin-based approach, uh, where Alice owns some coins and wants to send them to Bob, or the account-based approach that Alice and Bob have accounts and the Alice wants to debit her account with some amount of funds and Bob was gonna get the credit, right? So there's like these two uh, basic approaches. Now, in both cases, we may want to maintain state, and that state will come in the form of a database. Um, now, typically here, um, either the state will have the information about the accounts of all parties, or will have the ownership information about the coins. Um, I have to say that, you know, having a state um, may actually not, and maintaining that state by a set of parties, which will be at the crux of that issue, uh, is not necessary. You can have situations where you have some physical assumption. For example, you have coins in the real world, and you can use those as, as a way to implement the state, let's say, in a physical manner. And as a matter of fact, also using quantum techniques, for those of you that are interested in quantum techniques, I advise you to have a look at our you know, paper a few years ago on one-shot signatures, just to see how is that possible to do payments without maintain, maintaining state in the form of a database. So if you're interested in that, uh, using quantum techniques, you can go look at that. Nevertheless, this talk, as well as a lot of the work that I think will be covered in the next uh, uh, a few days, plus a lot of the work that happens in the wider computer science space these days is about distributing the state um, being able to tolerate some type of adversary is one of the most important requirements. Typically, these adversaries are called Byzantine in the sense that we don't want to make any assumption about how they behave. All right, so let's take like a simple account-based approach um, and study this one. Um, as we will see, this would be quite fitting, uh, especially in the context of regulatory compliance, which, uh, which will come later. So we have like Alison, Bob, uh, wants to transfer some funds, and um, what's happening is that uh, we would like to make this transfer, and the precondition is that every account has a public uh, and a secret key pair. So basically, there is a way to authenticate to the system, and that authentication uh, will be based on, on a public key setting. Um, now, what we want to achieve by the payment is to debit Alice's account and credit Bob's account. And, you know, a very simple implementation of this, think about it, is that every maintainer has a copy of the state, and then Alice will broadcast the transaction to the maintainers, and the maintainers will update the state accordingly. So, a sort of a 30,000 feet view, I mean, that's what we want to achieve. Now, it won't gonna, it's not going to be that simple. 
right? It's not going to be that simple. Like, so we'll see what can go wrong. Now, the first problem is that the broadcast um, may not be reliable. So that means that when Alice broadcasts the transaction to everybody, uh, and then they want to update their state, the state of the honest maintainers can diverge. Now, when you run into this issue, you can have the problem of what is the actual state of the system? So suppose like we want to answer that question. Um, so things can get tricky there. So it might be possible th there uh, to implement some protocol. So for example, like using a reliable broadcast, we can make sure that the honest maintainers will get the right output. Then we can even define the proper state of the system by, for instance, assuming honest majority of maintainers and asking them to tell us. Now, this is not enough. Um, we may also have another pitfall uh, in the approach I mentioned, which is a replay attack. So if we just sign a transaction and send it to the network, then what prevents a transaction from being replayed? Now, this is a standard and well-known problem that one way to solve it is by encoding into the state some type of uh, liveness information, some freshness information, for example, a counter. And then every time a transaction is being issued, we increment that counter. Those of you that know how Ethereum works, for example, you will immediately recognize this. Okay, so suppose we want to follow this approach, how fast we can achieve um, a payment. So let's see like this, how this reliable broadcast can work. Now, um, this problem has been studied for many decades um, and uh, it's round complexity in the case of deterministic protocols can be proportional in the number of failures. If it's probabilistic, we can get much faster. But here I'm gonna focus on what we call the optimistic case, where we have um, basically uh, a situation where we assume when things are gonna go fine. Like, you know, so basically uh, in this case, we can map it to the case of an honest sender. So in that case, we can see that we can have just three rounds and actually two rounds plus the sender sending the transaction. Um, that would be in the case where uh, we have the number of maintainers being like, over 3t plus one, where t is the number of um, the number of malicious parties. So very simple protocol to describe. Every maintainer sends to the other the transaction that they have received, and then they try to compare nodes. If n minus t votes arrive for one transaction, then we forward these messages and we can uh, notify the um, user that the transaction has been approved, uh, and then we can terminate. And now observe that this bound was carefully selected so that we can achieve what we want. Like the key property of this one third restriction of the adversary will give us what you see on the right of that slide. If you have N minus T votes for uh, a particular choice V, you cannot have another N minus T votes for a different choice V prime. Um, and that's very easy to see like, you know, uh, by just doing a simple counting argument like the one that's done in, in the slide. So this protocol like would work in this optimistic case, but has like some important downsides. First of all, its complexity is quadratic, as actually cubic if we can, if you count it in terms of bits. And if you have a malicious sender, like someone that will not actually just send a transaction to everybody, the protocol can deadlock on one transaction. Um, so, however, and, and this is something that we have to solve, right? But what we have as a takeaway here. Um, that if we make assumptions about the center doing like, or being optimistic or something in the reliable broadcast case, uh, we, we can get like a fairly efficient round complexity. So can we do any better than that? Focusing on the particular case we have on payments. All right. So here is, a, um, I'll explain our, the approach that we take in this work. Now, we are dispersing the system state. So we don't have the maintainers like doing any bookkeeping, um, except like for one thing, uh, for the minimum minimal thing that I'll explain what it is. And basically we are um, sending the balances of users back to the users. Um, so imagine now that the state of every user is a counter and the balance of your account, and this is signed by the maintainers. So how can you do that? Well, a simple way that you can do that in the permission setting is to use threshold signatures. Later on in the talk, I'm gonna move on to uh, the permissionless setting. So I will explain how we can take it there. And now what happens is that every maintainer will keep a table uh, that has 
the name of the user, the public key, and the last known certified counter. Um, so the essential here is that we have to keep uh, the counter uh, corresponding to the user because otherwise we cannot prevent uh, these replay attacks. So here is how the um, there's a sort of a suite of protocols that I'm going to describe, but these fast payments with dispersed system state would work like this. Bob um, invoices Alice. We can actually assume that somehow this is a given interaction that we take it for granted, and then we have a very fast like two round operation in the optimistic case. Alice and Bob uh, basically sign a statement that they say they want the transaction to take place. They reveal the next state to the maintainers. The maintainers like sign it and send it back. Right. So this interaction is just like one, two. Right. So in this way, we can settle the payments uh, as fast as in two rounds uh, with linear communication complexity. That's the main benefit. So this is fairly simple, but of course, as I mentioned already, this is the optimistic case. So what can go wrong in this protocol? So what goes wrong in this protocol is if one of the two counterparties does not cooperate. So a malicious counterparty, what they're gonna do or what they might do is the following. So in this case, let's say we have Alice and Bob, Alice is malicious, uh, Bob invoices Alice, transmits uh, you know, his intention of engaging in a transaction with Alice. Um, and Alice on the other hand, does not actually uh, do that as prescribed. And he just does a partial delivery. So the problem here is that Bob is stuck. Basically, he, the maintainer is waiting for a matching transaction from Alice in order to complete the state update, uh, but this doesn't happen. So what is there to happen in this case? Should the maintainer stop waiting for Alice's communication? So we have a bunch of options here. Now, one approach uh, that can be done is to invoke agreement. Uh, so in what sense we invoke agreement here? Bob is unhappy about the current state of affairs, uh, issues an abort request, and then a binary business in agreement protocol is invoked by the maintainers to answer one question. Have I seen this transaction or not? Observe that agreement here or some other way of resolving the problem is critical because the maintainers cannot just take the word of Bob here for granted. Why? Because it could be the case that an abort request is made maliciously uh, and then Bob essentially plans to double spend his account. So that's approach number one. Nevertheless, there's other options as well, like observe that the reason that we invoke here, um, then we invoke an abort protocol, is that um, Alice has not transmitted her signed statement that wants to complete the transaction with Bob. So this suggests that we can also try to take a different route and solve the um, sort of pessimistic run of the protocol using optimistic fair exchange. So what is optimistic fair exchange? It's a two-party protocol where parties enter two signatures as input. Um, and the intention is that they both want to obtain signatures as output or the non-aborting counterparty will uh, uh, obtain an encrypted claim to the aborting party's signature. Um, so in uh, standard optimistic fair exchange, there is a trustee that plays the role of the arbiter, but using secret sharing techniques, it's in this permission sort of version of the problem that I'm describing now, we can have the maintainer sharing the role of this arbiter. Now, there's a few more like details here and uh, nuances. The board may still take place because a dishonest counterparty may uh, hook this current transaction to a previously, um, to a previous state of his, but this is a case that we can also handle. So this tells you like a, um, you know, um, sort of a, a high level, like slightly technical, but like a high level view of this class of protocols we are looking at by what I'm calling like fast distributed payments. Um, so a promise on the title of this talk is to deal with privacy. So now I'm gonna change gears 
and I'm going to start discuss, describing what are we going to do about privacy. So when you think about privacy, you have to ask some questions about what privacy really means in the particular context that you are. So what do you want to hide? The number of transactions performed by party, for instance, the value of a transfer in the transaction, or who are the counterparties in a transaction, or whether even a transaction takes place. Um, in this talk, or in this work, uh, which I'm presenting, we are going to focus on the three first bullets. We're not going to attempt to hide whether transactions take place or not. I mean, this is uh, uh, like a much harder setting in the case of privacy. Basically, the question, does communication takes place or not? Right. So this is something that traditionally is solved by cover traffic uh, and techniques similar to that, uh, which um, is a sort of an orthogonal question than what I want to solve in this case. So what I want to solve in this case, in this setting is focus on the application layer and ask uh, how can we hide the counterparties and the amounts of funds that they transferred to each other. So going back to the approach I, I uh, was presenting so far, you remember like an essential part, an essential component of a party's account was this counter and that was saying like my account has done like 500 transactions and the next time i issue a payment i go to 501 right i sign that statement and then the maintainers counter sign it so i obtain the certified version of my account you know so we want to hide this right that is essential that we hide this so here is our first uh, sort of technique that we're going to use um, I call this the obfuscated account counter. Um, the obfuscated technique is to use, uh, associate with every account, the public key of the form to the A. And, and what you see there as a counter is to the A, to the A squared, to the A cubed, and so forth. Uh, this is actually a, a sequence of cryptographic objects when it's defined in a finite cyclic group that in cryptography has been used over time uh, with various benefits um, for its alleged pseudorandomness, right? So the strong Diffie-Hellman assumption actually postulates that the above sequence, the, the sequence that you see in the slide, is indistinguishable from random elements in the group. So you can think of this as a pseudorandom tag sequence. Now, why is this good? Well, because this gives us an obfuscated counter sequence. So instead of having associated with my account, you know, let's say a counter like 500 or something like this, now instead I have a um, uh, basically an obfuscated version of that counter. So at every time that I am at the X transaction, I, my counter is to the A to the X, right? So that's how it looks. And now here is our privacy preserving uh, protocol again at the high level. We have Bob who invoices Alice, and then Alice and Bob are going to use an anonymous channel. What's going to happen with the system is that we're going to use a distributed blind signature, and the state of Alice and Bob is going to be blindly signed by the maintainers. Now, blindly signed, however, there is going to be information associated with this, the updated state that is going to be proven in zero knowledge that all is calculated correctly. So for example, this G to the A to the X is going to transition to G to the A to the X plus one. And then there's going to be a zero knowledge uh, protocol that is going to establish that this is correctly computed from the previous value. Um, so this gives you like a high level view of how the protocol is going to look like, but um, it's not, this is not enough, right? So we have privacy and, you know, I'll tell you uh, in a few more details if time allows how we achieve, uh, you know, the full privacy preserving operation, but at the same time, we have regulatory requirements. So what kind of regulatory requirements we may want to have in a payment system? We have KYC or know your customer requirements. We have AML, anti-money laundering requirements. We have requirements related to financial crimes, like transactions should have limits or suspicious individuals can have their transactions identified. And finally, we also have stability requirements. We may not want accounts 
uh, to have a lot of funds in them. Uh, and actually, the stability requirement is something that frequently has been invoked in the context of central bank digital currencies, uh, exactly because there is concerns if central banks start issue digital currencies, you may get into a situation where uh, currencies, um, uh, the role of commercial banks is destabilized, and it might be difficult for actually monetary policy to uh, to work well. So there might be like issues, other issues that may want to impose such restrictions. So one question is, um, if you want to impose uh, and meet all these requirements, how can you achieve that in this setting? So I'm going to give you an, an example of how this might work. So I'm just lining out here uh, exactly how that scheme works. Um, first of all, every account has a balance. We call it B, and then it has the total amount of money that was sent, that's S. Total money that was received, we call it R, and it has this obfuscated counter. Now, what's very important, uh, and I'm going to highlight in this slide, is the fact that um, every account has a secret sharing of that value A, and that value is secret shared between the maintainers. So that's an important part that's going to come uh, uh, and, and show you why this is relevant um, in, the, um, in the case where we want to trace transactions. All right, so this is how it works. We have a, a verifiable secret sharing where this secret exponent A that determines the pseudorandom sequence of uh, the party can be reconstructed by T plus one shares. Uh, between the maintainers, and the maintainers now will keep this user record that um, is going to have information uh, related to the user. So let me now move on to how a payment works. So when a payment happens in this private system, uh, what happens is that the account of the sender and the receiver, one is debited, the other is credited with the funds, um, and then what you do is like you advance to the next obfuscated counter. At the same time, Every transaction is going to have these ciphertexts that encode the public key of the sender, the public key of the receiver, and the value of the transaction. So what happens is that I'm going to keep exactly the same um, template of interaction as I did before. So first, there's going to be a round where um, Alice and Bob are going to exchange some encrypted information and declare their willingness to uh, engage in the interaction. Um, they're going to sign this with what's known in cryptography as a signature of knowledge, basically proving that all this uh, information is cryptographically sound. And after that, we're going to have, again, the same optimistic fast payment operation. We transmit uh, values to the operators. We get them back. And the whole protocol, again, in the optimistic case, terminates in two rounds. Um, so this is how it works. Now, observe now something that's very crucial uh, that I'm going to take advantage of this in the tracing operation. Every time we do a transaction, we expose this obfuscated counter. And now this obfuscated counter, along with the ciphertexts of the sender and the receiver, is maintained in a ledger which is separate for every maintainer. We make no attempt, and that's a crucial point, we make no attempt to reconcile that ledger running consensus. We just leave every maintainer to have their own view of this all right so you can think of this as a bag of um basically obfuscated transaction data and encrypted information that is maintained uh locally by each one of the maintainers based on the transactions that they have approved all right so i'm skipping like more details and then i'm going to tell you a little bit how privacy revocation works so privacy revocation works can work against the transaction. So basically, you can point to a transaction, and remember now, there's this encrypted values, public key of sender, public key of receiver, plus the value of transaction, uh, using threshold decryption, uh, proving that it's correctly done. We can find the information about every transaction. Uh, I'm skipping again, like details about how this works. And then I'm going to also show you how tracing works. Now, tracing is an operation that says, I have a particular user that I would like to trace her transactions. So for example, like I've identified a suspicious transaction, I've revealed one of the counterparties, this is a suspicious counterparties, now I wanna trace transactions. So observe now what happens. 
is that the maintainers can use the um, fact that the verifiable secret sharing exists of uh, the value that is the secret exponent that determines the pseudo-random counter sequence, the obfuscated counter sequence of every party, and they can start reconstructing this. And what happens, again, without running agreement, I think that's another like interesting part, what, what happens here is that the uh, maintainers can actually walk the obfuscated counter sequence at any, at any point recovering the next uh, level by doing essentially modular exponentiation over the secret shared value. And they will recover the obfuscated counter sequence and hence discover all the transactions of the suspicious party. And then these transactions can be further de-anonymized or investigated. So this is how this works. I'm skipping again the other details. And basically I showed you how this is gonna work out in the um, um, sort of, um, how we can achieve, let's say privacy and at the same time, conditional revocation of privacy and tracing. Two questions that are relevant um, in what people known as um, centrally banked digital currencies, or if you want regulatory compliant payments. Now, in the last five minutes, I believe I still have, because um, I'll be happy also to take time for questions. Um, we have a permissionless version of that whole scheme. Um, First of all, like without privacy, because the privacy addition is, is, um, can be quite challenging, but even the non-private version um, is actually quite interesting. So in the permissionless uh, setting, and I should say permissionless here by focusing on a proof of stake setting, what we want to achieve is what's known as dynamic availability. We don't want to make any assumption about how many parties are online at any given time. So the protocol should be able to run at any level of participation. And we may want to even have unannounced arrivals and departures. We want to have fast settlement in some optimistic conditions. And we also want to achieve high throughput. So how we can achieve all that. So there's a number of challenges and I'm just gonna highlight a few of the things uh, that are needed. First of all, this idea of using threshold signatures to certify the state of parties, of course we cannot use it, right? So this was meant for the permission setting. So do we have a tool that is similar for the permissionless setting. So we, we studied this uh, in the context of what we call stake-based threshold multi-signatures, a primitive that we called Mithril. And the idea there is that you have a public keys with weights, like the number of coins, let's say, of every public key. And we also have a random nonce. And a stake-based threshold multi-signature enables you to have a certain stake threshold. Let's say you wanna say, 68% of the stake in the system, let's say billion stakeholders supports that statement. And then we have a message and we have a label. And what happens is that the system of stake-based threshold multi-signature basically does something like this. It uses something like a verifiable random function. I'm just simplifying things given that there's not much time to explain. There is a verifiable random function like primitive that determines eligibility. And then this enables me to sign and then signatures can be aggregated together in a compact certificate. And that's the stake-based threshold multi-signature. So basically <laughs> this primitive can be a drop-in replacement for threshold signatures. Now there's a few more elements that we need to go to the permissionless setting. First of all, we need to get the public keys. We can also assume that the public keys exist. And we also need like randomness in order to seed this election process. So for this, we can use a proof of stake blockchain like Ouroboros Genesis, for instance, from uh, past work that we've done. And this now, as opposed to having being a transaction ledger is actually just a public key registration and randomness beacon engine. Because all the payments are now gonna be happening if you want off chain, right? Based on this uh, stake best stake-based threshold multi-signature primitive uh, and the fact that parties basically keep their uh, state signed uh, locally. Um, observe that 
This primitive will also require a publicly known threshold of participation. So it could be the case when you have a sharp drop in participation that you are unable like, to certify state. So in that case, you may you will have to do like this fallback operation, and you can start using the blockchain actually for transactions as well, in which case settlement is going to be slow. But this basically tells you that you can get this best of both worlds behavior, uh, which is something quite interesting. Like when you have good conditions of high participation, you settle fast, but when you have um, sort of bad conditions, you can settle slow, but still do progress. Um, and basically, given I don't have much time, I'm going to skip exactly how we do these fast payments in the permissionless setting. Um, I guess, like, perhaps, like, what's interesting here is that we may still want to achieve fair exchange in order to deal with this malicious counterparty problem. And in fact, there we can use resource based fair exchange or use an optimistic fair exchange variation in what is known the Yoso model. You only speak once, uh, which is if you want like the permissionless analog um, of threshold cryptographic primitives. Um, to summarize, like there's a number of applications we have with these primitives, permissionless cryptocurrencies with fast payments, pegged stable coins and centrally banked digital currencies that meet various regulatory compliance considerations. And uh, these are the three most related papers. Peretti uh, basically has most of these ideas related to privacy in the permission setting, all applied on central bank digital currencies, Mithril uh, stake-based threshold multi-signatures, and Caduceus, uh, the upcoming paper we have right now on fast decentralized payments and, and fair exchange. So with this, I'll stop. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thanks a lot, Agilos. Thank you for the, for the great talk. Uh, we I have one question uh, which pertains uh, from Alberto Sonino on Slack, uh, and it pertains to slide 10 or 11. And he asks, okay. uh, what is the paper basically that is uh, that you mentioned that is using binary agreement to unlock the unhappy state? Uh, once, I think, maybe slide before. Yeah, uh, binary, binary agreement, agreement though. Yeah, 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 this one, yes. Which paper? Yes, uh, I, I think Alberto asks, uh, which per paper are you referring to here? Um, well, th this is the first paper I mentioned um, in, my, uh, in my list of papers. At least that, that paper, I mean, I just have to say, like, it really depends, right? I'm presenting this as a sort of in an abstract sense, uh, yeah. but specifically in the context of payments, uh, to unstuck the payment process that's happening because of one of the counterparties aborting. Um, in that specific context, in Peredi uh, that we presented uh, last year in CCS, we use binary agreement uh, in order to resolve, to unstuck basically the, uh, the state update. I have a I have a question regarding the scale of Mitril. So, so Mitril is very interesting work and we have been doing some some related work, but what what happens as a as a practical challenge is, uh, you know, if you have a proof of stake uh, network with a large population of nodes, let's say thousands of nodes, and they are like uh, essentially also distributed, like you don't have uniform stake, uh, but you have actually like uh, certain distribution. So certain validators have more stake, and the others have less. Like, uh, how does Mitril work? What, what is the practical scalability of uh, of Mitril in this case, right? And, no, no, it's actually, it work? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, so so it, it works actually, okay. Um, so Mitril was designed exactly for the large scalability uh, setting that you mentioned. So basically billions of stakeholders, arbitrary stake distributions, um, and, um, low communication complexity, right? So so basically you don't want one problem you have with a classical threshold signature, or if you try to somehow simplify the problem of state-based threshold multi-signature with classical techniques is that you can flood the network with, with signatures because everybody signs, right? So, so what we want is, that's a key point, observe that we, we split what is to be signed if you want in two parts the label and the message. Now, what's a key point here is that the label 
is the one that is going to be fed into a VRF-like process that is going to determine if you are eligible to sign. So a key point is that you won't be able to sign all messages. The label is going to determine whether you are eligible to sign or not. Right, so this is meant there to offer scalability in the following sense. We don't want everybody to become eligible to sign because they're gonna flood the network with signatures. Right, so I'm not sure if that answers what, what, what you were saying. Now, now, what is difficult about this is that why we do the split between label and message, because in many cases, the adversary may be able to influence the message and we don't want to give the adversary what's known as a grinding opportunity by influencing different versions of the message until he basically wins. So for example, in the case I'm in the application I have here, there's a transaction between two counterparties. If Mithril, so the label is applied on the transaction identifier, then a malicious counterparty can you know, try many different transactions still basically all the adversarial parties win. So this is kind of the grinding um, Thing I was mentioning. So what you need to do if you want to use this safely in the protocol is that you identify in the label part a part that's ungrindable, like basically it could be a timestamp, uh, it could be um, public nonce. So some source of randomness which is public, unpredictable at the time that public keys are determined, plus low entropy like an index or a um, so a timestamp, and then the part that the adversary can choose or influence on the spot, you put it on the message. So if you do this, then the system scales, right? So, so, so with some care about what you sign and how you apply it, you, you can get like a large scale um, sort of threshold signature behavior from stake-based threshold multi-signatures.